All right, um, to continue with chapter 13, I wanted to talk about something that we sort of refer to in general physics, but I don't think we really had adequate time to discuss it. And what that is, is what we mean by an inertial frame of reference. Um, and so basically, um, an inertial frame of reference is often um, said to be a frame of reference where Newton's laws of motion hold true. And that is where um, basically what they're saying is that the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration, that if you applied those that equation and referenced all the forces that you were aware of, that that would explain what you see. Um, another thing that we're told is that if you have one frame of reference, and let's just call that x and y, and maybe just call that reference frame s, and you have another frame of reference, x prime and y prime, and you might call that s prime. If this is moving, if the s prime frame of reference is moving at a constant velocity relative to frame of reference s, and then if frame of reference s has been determined to be an inertial frame of reference, we're going to use this shorthand because I don't feel like keep writing it, then if frame of reference S is an inertial frame of reference and frame of reference S prime is moving with a constant velocity relative to frame of reference S, then this is inertial as well. So let's talk about, well, first of all, no, I want to say one more thing. And the reason is that, that that's true is that in general, if we have a frame of reference that is accelerating, then it is not inertial. In fact, what we usually call these are non-inertial frames of reference. And basically, what happens is when you have a non-inertial frame of reference, in order to explain what you are experiencing while you're in that frame of reference, you have to introduce forces that aren't real. And we call those fictitious forces. The most straightforward example that I could give of this is you are in a non-inertial frame of reference if you're in any, um, if you are moving in a circle at a constant velocity. Think of the case when you exit a highway and you go in the cloverleaf pattern of the exit ramp. As you go around that, that turn, or around the bend, you may feel that you're being forced towards your door, the, your driver's side door, if, you're, if that's the outside of the circle. And often we've referred to that as the centrifugal force, but hopefully you know by now that that's not real. There is no physical thing that's pushing you outward. We learn that it's actually your inertia that makes you feel that way. But what I'm getting back at is circling back is while we're sitting in the car, if we had no other way to explain what was happening to us, we would have to say that there was a force pushing us outward. And we might call that a centrifugal force. We had to introduce a fictitious force in order to explain our observation. We're going to look at this in a little bit more detail by um, doing something that physicists love to do. We're going to use a train car as an example. And we're going to have an observer in the train, and so we'll call him Observer 1. And then we got a guy out here standing next to the train. I'm going to call him observer number two. And we're going to say that the train is accelerating. Now, if, if we had 
a mass on a string suspended from the ceiling, we might realize that the reason that that, what's going to happen is that, so let me back up again. If we imagine the train was stationary and all of a sudden the train car started accelerating to the right, but initially this mass on a string was hanging straight down from the ceiling of the train car. As it would accelerate, we would expect to see that ball or mass on a string get deflected backwards. And what I want to show here is the idea of how we might explain that based on the two frames of reference and then demonstrate how the person in the non-inertial frame of reference, which you might have guessed, hopefully you guessed, is observer number one, will have to introduce a fictitious force in order to explain what he sees, in order for him to explain why that mass on a string is being deflected. So we're going to just write this down. Observer 1 is in a non-inertial frame of reference. And observer 2 is in an inertial frame of reference. Okay. So let's start first with, I'm going to start with observer 2, because this is non-inertial, and things are a little bit more, if you will, normal. And I'm going to redraw the mass on a string, and also say that I understand that this is accelerating. And so, um, if I wanted to identify the forces acting on this mass, I'd have the tension, and I'm also going to call this angle theta, and I'm going to have mg. And so if I look at my forces, my forces in my x direction, I'm going to have to set in equal to mass times acceleration, because that mass on a string is accelerating along with the train car. And it's obvious to me that that's happening because as an outside observer, I can observe the acceleration. And so what I find is the only x force I have is t times the sine of theta equals the mass times acceleration. And in the y direction, I don't, there's um, equilibrium, the mass is not moving up or down. I have t cosine of theta minus mg equals zero. So in any case, the way that I might look at this and explain what's going on in this scenario as observer number two, who is in my inertial frame of reference, um, he can explain everything without introducing any sort of strange, fictitious force. Um, he notices that the train car accelerated and the ball that was attached to the string, you know, that, that mass on the string had a little bit of inertia, and so it does lag in its response, and that could help to explain why, that explains why it's um, sort of falling behind. But what's going to happen is, after that instant in time, the x component of the tension in the string is what will allow the mass to continue to accelerate in the x direction. And so that all works out really well. When he looks in the y direction, he notices that the mass does not move up or down. And so he's, he's explained everything using Newton's laws. Newton's laws apply in this frame of reference and therefore it's a non it's a, an inertial frame of reference. So now we're going to and let's just change color to make it clear observer number 2. I'm sorry, <laughs> observer 1. Now he's inside the train. He doesn't know
He doesn't know it's accelerating. And that might seem odd to you, but if you think about it, he's in a train car. It doesn't have any windows. He can't see outside. And so he has really no way to definitively say that he's accelerating. You might have you might have talked about a little bit in modern physics how, um, you know, if you're accelerating vertically, that acceleration can mimic gravity, and it's hard to tell the difference if you don't have any sort of outside input, and this is very similar. So when he is looking at the ball hanging straight down, well, hanging at an angle, He's going to say, okay, well, there's tension acting in the string. There's a weight acting down here. But he's also going to say there has to be some sort of force that is pulling the ball to the left because that's why it's deflected. And so when we look at the sum of the forces, let's do Y first. You know, from his viewpoint, the ball on the string is motionless, but it's still deflected. And so, in his eyes, that ball is in equilibrium because it's not accelerating. Remember, because he can't see outside, he has no way to know that he's in an accelerating frame of reference. And so, in the y direction, we have t cosine theta minus mg equals zero. And in the x direction, he has t sine theta minus f equals 0. So he's had to introduce this fictitious force. It's only fictitious because we, don't e we know it's not real, but from his viewpoint it isn't. And if we compare these two expressions... it turns out that the magnitude of that fictitious force would have to be equal to the mass times the real acceleration of the train. And so I hope that this makes some sense, but I think it's kind of interesting to think about how in an inertial frame of reference, F equals MA applies really easily. You don't have to introduce anything kind of fishy in order to explain things. But when you're in a non-inertial frame of reference, which by definition is a, an accelerating frame of reference, in order to explain what you observe, you have to introduce forces that don't actually truly exist. And actually what you're seeing are called inertial forces caused by the real acceleration. Again, which as the non-inertial observer, you don't know that exists. So... Um, so that's why I what I wanted to go over, because I think it's pretty interesting to think about it um, and think about maybe some other situations where you could think about, um, maybe you think about an elevator accelerating upwards or downwards and how if you're in the elevator, you would introduce fictitious forces to explain your observations. Um, also, the idea of the amusement park ride, how you'd have to introduce fictitious forces to explain what you see as you go in a circle. So I hope that that's helpful. I just wanted to make sure that you had some good exposure to that idea. And um, now we're ready to move on to some more applications of F equals MA, finding the equations of motion for objects.